forces of terrorism that are willing to use violence against civilians, they're evolving. The Middle East today is unstabilized. The terrorism are climbing more and more high to the top. If the global community doesn't respond, and even if it isn't on my doorstep today, it will be eventually. Israel became the most innovative country in counterterrorism because necessity is the mother mm. of innovation. We're standing here, and there's 250 feet of reinforced, electronically supervised wall into the ground. Every day you go to work, you say, this is the day I'm going to be a hero. 40 years ago, people said, oh, that's Israel's problem. They can deal with it. 30 years later, it's the biggest threat on democracies. Ever since the Jewish people returned to these streets more than 100 years ago, the threat of terrorism has been part of everyday life. So much so that as terrorism evolved and the uh, methodology of it changed, so did the response and the knowledge, the know-how of counterterrorism on the Israeli side. Today, Israel is a superpower in the science of counterterrorism. And that's important because terrorism isn't any more restricted to Israel, the Middle East, or one or two countries. It's a global issue and a global issue that requires a global response. So today we're going deep into the knowledge and the experience of how to counter terrorism from Israel to the rest of the world. When you watch TV and you sit in your living room and you see the airplanes in 9-11 crashing into the World Trade Center, you are part of it. Today, with the umbrella of the Iranian, all the threats are coming from terror of extremists radical movements. There will be always threat. I mean, until we, we found the solution, there will always threat. And you have to help this community live with that threat and try to live a normal and life. I can tell you that it's becoming harder and harder every escalation. We need to unite, not just as Israel, we as the Western countries. Without the joint efforts, we are not going to win the war. If you want to uproot terrorism, you really need to understand the mindset, the psyche, the philosophy behind it. We're on our way to the Reichmann University in Herzliya to meet with Professor Boaz Ganol. Now, Professor Ganol does something super interesting. He leads one of the first counterterrorism institutes worldwide. And what they do is go deep in thought about how to uproot, how to combat terrorism. Hi, hey, Boaz. Welcome to the ICT. Thank you. Good to see you. Please. Let's start by saying that when we are talking about the definition of terrorism, there is no one acceptable definition which is acknowledged internationally because one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And that's why I, I put a lot of importance on the definition of terrorism because this is the first pillar from which you can build understanding better practices and policies, global policies uh, and cooperation in contending with terrorism. What would your definition be? Terrorism is the deliberate use of violence mm -hmm. aimed against civilian targets by non-state actors in order to achieve political ends. If you uh, adopt the definition that I suggest to you, actually you can find the act of terrorism in biblical time. Mm -hmm. But what is a new phenomenon is what we call modern terrorism. Okay. Modern terrorism is a psychological warfare. The killing is a tool to achieve something which is much bigger than that, fear and anxiety. Terrorists can win the war without shooting one bullet. They uh, disrupt the economy, they disrupt the day-to-day -day life and uh, activity and so on and so forth. This phenomenon erupted in the midst of the 20th century. The immediate era after uh, the Second World War, more and more states got independence mm -hmm. and became democracies. And I would argue that the democracy is heaven for terrorists. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm against democracy. I don't know any better regime to live in. But still, a democracy has embedded values, liberal democratic values, which exactly give the backwind which is needed for the terrorists to act. Well, we've seen a different thing, which is the, the big-scale wars, country against country, multiple countries against country, they don't exist anymore. I mean, are the two things connected? They are tightly connected because uh, the world has learned something from the First and the Second World War, which is that wars deteriorate rapidly. It can start with a local conflict and become a global war at the end of the day. And second, maybe most important, is the price of the war. How many people died in the Second World War? Millions and millions and millions of people. 
And suddenly states... So a terrorism is the solution for exactly. that? Exactly. How? By proxies. Few states that founded terrorist organizations, sponsored them, gave them orders to conduct activities that would promote the interests of the state. To name a few, USSR, Syria, Libya, and nowadays we see Iran as a spearhead of state sponsorship for terrorism, and so on and so forth. The changing modern world not only created the fertile soil for terrorism to grow, it also provided new tools for terrorists to use. TV actually had a very important role mm -hmm. because people could have known about terrorist attacks by reading the newspaper. But when you sit in your living room and you watch TV, the impact of anxiety is much, much bigger than any other attack. If I need to pinpoint mm -hmm. a date, I think it's the Olympic Games in, in Munich. Why? Because in the Olympic Games, we had an unprecedented concentration of uh, media in one place, in a certain time, where the attention of all the world was aimed to that. And that was the reason why the Palestinians chose to attack exactly there. At the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich, the Palestinian terrorist group, Black September, killed two members of the Israeli Olympic team and took nine more hostage. After a failed rescue attempt by the German authorities, all nine of the hostages were killed. This attack, known as the Munich Massacre, went down in history as the first of its kind to attract such a widespread media attention. George Habash, he was part of the planners of the attack in Munich. He wrote that they chose that specific target because it's as if they wrote the word Palestine on the Everest mountain. Everybody can see, everybody's watching that. Afterwards, the whole phenomenon has, has changed. Uh, you know, you have this uh, concept of copycat. Mm -hmm. Whatever is being regarded as a successful measure is being then copycat by, by other terrorists altogether. Unfortunately, Israel has uh, found itself as a laboratory, not just for counterterrorism, but also for the terrorists themselves. Welcome back to the studio. It's amazing to see, Mati, we're surrounded with challenges and threats all around, but God is still in control. 100%. God is still looking over Israel. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, we, we, we've looked at the facts. We've talked to the experts. And this idea that, you know, that terrorism is a, is a one-time thing, that, that's not the case. Terrorism keeps evolving and moving. And from the early days, we've really had to come up with, with creative and unique ways to deal mm -hmm. with it. So when we spoke to Boaz Ganel, you really see that on his wall, where all these international organizations are saying, hold on, we're dealing with a problem we've never dealt with before, but who has? Israel. So let's go ask them what they've been doing to, to solve that problem. So even in that issue, Israel becomes a lot, sad to say, yeah. but becomes a lie to the nation. Yeah, even in the problematic aspects, yes. we, we've learned first. Mm -hmm. So Mati, let's continue watching. We're on our way to meet Major General Eitan Dangot. Eitan was the coordinator of Israel's activity in Judea and Samaria, but also the military secretary to three different ministers of defense. And those roles give him this really deep understanding of Israel's challenges in this region, and more so how we've evolved to deal with them. Technology, methodology, all of that. He is really the expert on this topic. General. Hi. Hey, good how to see you. How are you? We are in a process around us and also inside Israel that the turn is in a process of changement. What does it mean? We are losing around us the meaning of states. Lebanon, it's a state that controlled by the main terror organization in the world. I mean the Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Syria. Syria today is a way of joining between few militias mm -hmm. of terrorism and coming to Gaza. It's a place that controlled by radical Sunni terrorism. That it means that today, the terrorism really changed the rules of the game. With all the strongness of Israel, you have to choose. You can make a great damage, for example, to Lebanon, but what will be the value in the fact that millions of people will be suffered while the main operator in Lebanon, mm -hmm. it's a kind of terror organization that is leading by Iran. You have to be more direct towards the terror organization to destroy its financial sources 
or main people. The Middle East today is unstabilized. The terrorism are climbing more and more high to the top. So the decision in Israel was that we had to make a change. Hi. Hey, Ziv. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome so to our community. So this is home for you, huh? Yeah. Nativa Asara. This is Nativa Asara. And you've got quite the view to go right. with it. Right in so, front so of us. Right over there, that's Gaza, like just that's over Gaza. that hill. Yeah, that's Gaza over here. And you can see over there, Yeah. there's one of the Hamas spot, just in front of us. So we're really on the front. They're watching us right now. I met with the head of security for Nativa Asara, a small town that sits just 300 feet from the Gaza border and is one of the first lines of defense against Hamas terror attacks. What is interesting here, you can see that all these houses are actually exposed to the other side. So we're looking just a couple hundred meters away. Right, and you can that's see... That's the Gaza Strip. That's the Gaza Strip. You don't see many soldiers all around us. We have a lot of technology. If somebody is getting close to the fence... You already know. Right. So this is my first time at this fence, and it is a lot more impressive and imposing up close than it was in my head. Right. And, and then also, this is just above the surface. Right, and also under the surface, there's a great uh, cement wall that going 80 meters deep to the ground. What is that, 250 feet of reinforced, electronically supervised wall into the ground. Not only is there concrete over there, cameras, machine guns, and then a fence, and a no man's land, and electronics. Even if you tried to go under the ground, you'd be detected. Okay, so that, that's the whole idea. Yeah. Hamas has been digging underground tunnels for the past 20 years to smuggle weapons and infiltrate Israel. The new fence has been incredibly successful in eliminating this threat. But as advanced as this fence may be, when you live this close to the border, some attacks are simply unavoidable. I met with two IDF observers. They gave me some insight into what it's like to know that sometimes the only thing standing between Israel and a terrorist is soldiers like them. So we're sitting here in this base, or in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, loaded with technology, all this clandestine and secret equipment we can't talk about. But we're here to talk about what you do in the army, your observers in the IDF. So we sit in a situation room in front of screens and I look through cameras that watch over the Gaza Strip. We're protecting the border. We have to recognize if something is um, innocent and, and is part of the normal routine or right. if something is suspicious. And um, we know the territory very well. Mm -hmm. You know, like every rock, every bush in the area. Our intention isn't to attack, it's to prevent uh, an attack from happening and just to protect all the villages around and all the citizens. Yep. We make sure that it's safe, no one crosses, no one hurts them. That's a huge responsibility. It's very scary, a lot of responsibility is scary. You know, with all the technology and all the sensors and the wall and the barrier and all the money that went into that, in the end, it all comes down to 19 and 20 year old young women who are the human factor that really keeps us safe, preventing the next malicious attack on Israeli innocent citizens. That's pretty incredible. So for now, Israel has found a way to deal with the terror on its borders. But what does the future hold for Israel and the democratic world? We saw it time and again in history when states, including our best friend, United States, that has a tendency to be uh, isolationist. And I can understand why. Huge superpower, far away from other uh, states. Why should we bother with uh, problems that happens in, in different parts of the world? You should bother because if you won't bother, it will come to your territory. We saw it in 9-11. Unfortunately, I predicted we will see this uh, again. 2000, the second intifada, I was in the United States. I was sent by the Israeli foreign ministry. One of the lectures was planned to be on the 11th of September, 2001. The title of the invitation to my lecture was Countering Suicide Terrorism, The Israeli Challenge. On that day, the title was irrelevant in England. Yeah, it became because an international it challenge. It became an international challenge. As an outcome of the fact that Israel faced the biggest number of types of terrorist attacks, mm. hostage breaking situation, kidnapping, shooting at, lone wolf's attacks, stabbing, running down. Everything. Uh, everything you have in mind. Yeah. And balancing our liberal democratic values together with one important value, uh, which is protecting the right of the people to live, mm -hmm. the balance is the art.
Shalom from Jerusalem. Today we have a great honor having with us Dr. Nir Boms. Dr. Nir Boms is a specialist on the Middle East. Nir, what a great honor having you with us. Thank you very much. Good to be here. The show talks about terrorism in the region. There's no doubt that we're living in a new era. We are 10 years after the what we call the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a good departure point. The Arab Spring uh, symbolized the end of an era. For about four decades before, we have seen an era in the Middle East where we had a, few, a number of faces. They've ruled the countries. If it's up to them, they will continue until their death. Their children will take over. The system will work. But the people realized that the system really doesn't work. Yeah. And the spring very quickly developed into a winter. Mm -hmm. because A sad winter. A very sad winter. You say that that brought the stage or prepared the stage for the Abraham Accords? I think the Abraham Accords uh, is the, the most uh, significant uh, development that we have seen here, certainly in the last decade, and certainly in the, the context of all the uh, uh, Arab Spring era that have really uh, uh, created eventually more uh, blood than hope. And the Abraham Accords enable us to see hope. And they say something very simple. Working together and collaboration will bring prosperity to the region. There's no doubt when we talk about terrorism, we cannot not talk about Iran. The Iranian revolution of 1979 brought a different spirit uh, to Iran and put it on a trajectory uh, of an attempt of world uh, dominations. Now we need to fight the big devil, the United mm -hmm. States of America, and the small devil, which is Israel. Um, and since then, what we have seen is that Iran had made whatever it could in order to advance this agenda. And thereafter, uh, with a nuclear program, mm -hmm. I hope that enough pressure will be put in the context of the uh, nuclear agreement, JCPOA, in the context of other things that could be done so that Iran will, and that the Iranian people could join others in the Middle East, enabling us to uh, improve the, the somewhat fragile relationships. So there's no, there's no doubt that there was a huge change in the last 10 years. What do you see coming up in the next five years? I think in the next five years, we will see a certain consolidation of the two camps in the Middle East. One is the camp of Renaissance, the camps that includes the Abraham Accords and the circle of countries that believe in stability. And on the other hand, we'll see the other camp, which is the camp of resistance. The countries like Iran, Lebanon in the context of Hezbollah, Qatar, Kuwait. But I have a sense that we have a chance to solidify the block of stabilizer. We have people watching, people who love Israel, people who stand with Israel. Do you have any word? I, I first want to thank them. When somebody asks me, when you speak about the Middle East, when you speak about Iran, and you look about terrorism, how can you have hope? And I says, look, I'm, I'm Israeli. My national anthem is hope. And I think part of the Beautiful. hope comes from the prayers that we pray here in Jerusalem and the prayers that so many of you offer to us. Thank you very, very much. It was very insightful. And to you, our friends, once again, let's keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm on my way to meet Ron Cohen, the creator of SDR, a concise human intelligence method that allows everyone from civilians to law enforcers to prevent crime or terrorist attacks before they even happen. Ron Cohen, we're sitting here in one of your lovely homes in, uh, in the Judean Hills. Maybe start with who you are and what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm a lecturer. My history brought me to that, uh, my professional history actually, since the, the military. You've taken several decades of experience in, in defense from every angle of it and developed a philosophy and you try to transfer that philosophy to other people to help them counter terrorism. Exactly. Is, is that a correct uh, definition? Exactly. You see more than you think that you see. The method is called Search, Detect and React, SDR. The technologies right now are lacking capabilities of detection of intentions, and that's what the human being can do. If you do that the right way, following the protocols, you can detect malicious intentions, and then uh, it's another ball game. You're saying what, with your eyes, you look at someone else, and you can detect their intentions, and then pull out the negative ones, the, the malicious ones? Yeah. So when you have a malicious intent and you are coming with a malicious intent, you are shining out what we call a hunter mode. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have a chemical change in your behavior. Is this subconscious? All of these subconscious. Things? We are looking for the subconscious indicators. What are you looking for in his eyes that, that would set him apart as 
a predator or as a hunter, in, in your words. I want to look at muscle tension, shoulders, hands, mm -hmm. the palms, and the way he walks. Does he walk from point A to point B? Does he know? 99% of population knows where they're heading. Mm -hmm. A predator or a hunter does not know where he's going because he's following someone. Checking your six, that means you look back. I want to know why, if you're a predator or a prey. Avoiding uh, eye contact or acknowledging uniform surrounding you. And you're training people to pick up on that behavior pattern. Exactly. Ran's methodology comes from his lived experience, which formed the backbone to this powerful human intelligence tool. First of all, it came from my life experience. I suffered from PTSD, from the harsh experiences. I was a combat medic in, in the IDF. Out of this stressful situation, I developed tools, training, and a method that can help police officers, law enforcement, agencies, and civilians to try to avoid them uh, to be in, in, in my uh, stressful situations, part of um, um, immunity or resilient. My motivation is coming for my experience with fear, with panic, losing control over my muscle, losing sleep. Who, who can admit 19 years old that he's afraid from the dark? So you push it down, you push it down, and I forgot almost six months of my life, just from shame. Clearly, Ran was able to turn his life experience into powerful tools for counterterrorism. But what's most inspiring is that he's not just trying to prevent attacks, he wants to change the way we relate to the trauma they can cause. That's the first time I'm talking on camera. I think that's the victory of your story. So I think it's part of a life journey for me, just to say, yes, I'm PTSD, but I have life and I'm helping and I'm, I'm fruitful. And I think that's some kind of a breeze that I hope will reach up to people. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.